Thank you. Thanks, Victoria. Thanks very much for inviting me um, to have a chat with you all this evening. Um, I've been tasked to about talking about homologous recombination deficiency and how it impacts ovarian cancer. And this is really important. This is a new test that we have access to, and it's really transforming the options that we have for our patients. Um, I'm always uh, delighted to do stuff for Overcome, and this is it's considerably more enjoyable than the last thing that Victoria made me do, which was run in the giant ovary costume. Here you can see us doing this 10k um, in the vineyards of uh, Surrey, and what you can establish is that this giant ovary is neither very aerodynamic or very cooling on a hot summer's day, but we did do the race, and this is um, us. Anyway, thank you for inviting me, and what I'm going to talk about today is what is HRD, um, how we test for it, and why it's really important to test for HRD um, for ovarian cancer treatment and then we'll have plenty of time at the end for any questions and like Victoria said if you've got any questions that we don't get to I'm very happy to answer them later. So what is HRD? Well, it stands for homologous recombination repair or HRR pathway deficiency. So we're just really replacing one acronym with another one. And what is HRR? This is a type of DNA repair um, pathway. And before we go into really the details of HRD, I think it's important to go back to basics of, of, of biology. So all our organs in our body and indeed cancers are made up of billions of cells. Um, and the sort of brain box of the cell is the nucleus. That's where all the where all the action happens. And within the nucleus, we've got all our chromosomes that in, include all our genetic information. And in humans, in normal cells, there's um, 23 pairs of chromosomes. But in cancer cells, this number can vary greatly. Um, the DNA is what's tightly packed in the chromosomes. And then the DNA is this huge millions of sequencing of um, nucleotides and little fragments of them count as a gene. So uh, a, a sort of sequence of DNA is, is a gene and each gene controls a specific function or a specific purpose in the cell. And in cancer cells, it, there's many of these genes that are abnormal or, or misbehaving. And that's what indeed causes cancer and causes cancer to grow. So when we're talking about DNA repair, this is the level that we're talking at. And our DNA, so DNA in normal cells and indeed DNA in cancer cells is always under attack from both outside sources. So things like um, radiation, UV, chemicals, viral infection, but also within the cell, the process of the cells um, dividing and, and repairing themselves can cause damage to DNA. And you can see this, the DNA here, it's a double helix. So you've got this mirror image, two strands, one which is the mirror image of the other. And you can get either damage to one strand, which is what we call a single strand break. And that's quite easy to fix because you've got the, the complementary strand of DNA, which it just copies it from. And the cells have got lots of different ways of doing that. But if the, that doesn't fix itself, then when the cell divides, a cell divide normally, this can become a double strand break where both strands of the DNA are broken. Or you can get a, a, a de novo, a damage can cause direct a double strand break. And these are a bit harder to repair because you don't have the template to copy from. But over you know, millions of years of evolution, we've um, got these means of repairing DNA, which are quite accurate. And these uh, two main ones are homologous recombination and non-homologous enjoining. And when we're talking about HRD or homologous recombination deficiency, this is the pathway that we're talking about. So it's a type of DNA repair. It's very accurate type of DNA repair. And when the cells have broken both strands of their DNA, this is the one that they rely on. So when we talk about homologous recombination deficiency, it means that this pathway is not working in the cancer cell. We've known for a long time that this is important in ovary cancer because there are a number of proteins that can uh, and genes that control homologous recombination, but that includes also BRCA1 and BRCA2, and we, we know that these are important in ovarian cancer. And why that's important when we think about treatment is because repair of single strand breaks, so that's when you've got damage in just one strand, is, is controlled by lots of different proteins, but predominantly PARP1 and PARP2. And you might recognize the word PARP because this is where PARP inhibitors work. So these are drugs such as laparib and niraparib, and they inhibit this process. So if you have a cancer cell and you treat it with a PARP inhibitor, you can't repair damage to single strand DNA breaks. And that would normally be okay because when that becomes a double strand break that the cell would repair itself. But if you've got a cancer cell which has got broken homologous recombination or is homologous recombination deficient, it can't repair that break. So you get this massive accumulation of, of damage to the DNA and, ult and once it gets to a certain amount, the cell can't survive and the cell dies. And this is why PARP inhibitors work so well in patients with bracket cancers. 
But just to put this really simply, this is a the concept is known as synthetic lethality. But what this basically means is if you've got normal BRCA in a cell and your PARP's not inhibited, so here A and B, the, the cancer cells survive. If you if you've got a BRCA mutation or a BRCA abnormality, it doesn't matter because you've still got the PARP which can control the DNA, so the cell survives. And likewise, if you treat with a PARP inhibitor and, and, and get rid of PARP function, you've still got your BRCA, so you're okay. But in a BRCA mutant cancer cell, you've not got BRCA, you treat with a PARP inhibitor, the cell can't survive and, and you get cell death. And if you think about this in a way, you know, say the cancer cells are table, if you take off one leg, which is say the BRCA, the table will still stand. But if you take off the second leg, which is the part, the table will fall. So that's the concept of synthetic lethality in cancer. And that's why, as I said, PARP inhibitors work so well for BRCA cancers. But we know that there's a group of patients beyond those with a BRCA mutation with which these drugs work. So just as a reminder, BRCA is the, the hereditary uh, gene which can increase your risk of, of, of ovarian and, and breast cancer. And there are two different types of BRCA mutation. You can either have a germline mutation, that's where it's inherited, it's found in every cell in the body. And um, so you can detect it by either doing a blood test or you can test the tumor. And that's in about 12 to 15% of all patients with ovarian cancer. Um, and, and this is the one that, that, that can be hereditary. But in in addition to that, there's another a smaller group of patients that have a uh, BRCA mutation that's just arisen in the tumour. So as cancers develop, they get lots of mutations or abnormalities in lots of different genes. And this can also happen in BRCA. So this is not inherited. You won't detect it in the blood. You'll only find it in the tumour. And that affects about 5 to 7% of patients. So overall, about 1 in 5 or about 20% of, of ladies with ovarian cancer, the tumour will have a BRCA mutation either inherited or just within the tumour. And just as a, as a point of terminology, the terminology for BRCA is quite confusing and we're definitely at fault for this because we use these terms interchangeably. But a BRCA mutation, um, that means that the BRCA gene, the DNA of the BRCA gene is abnormal. Um, we also sometimes call this BRCA positive and we also sometimes call this BRCA deficient or just BRCA. So it can be quite confusing working at what we mean when we're talking about these BRCA abnormalities. And then the, on the other side, a normal BRCA gene without any damage is sometimes called BRCA wild type. That means that the gene's normal or normal or BRCA negative or non-BRCA. So um, we use these terms interchangeably, which is not ideal because it can be a bit confusing about what we're actually meaning when we're talking about it. And just as a reminder, PARP inhibitors, this new class of drugs, remember the PARP um, is involved in the DNA repair. These are tablets or capsules. They're targeted therapy, so they inhibit this PARP protein. Um, they're not a chemotherapy, um, so they're designed to target a specific weakness in ovarian cancer cells. And they're nearly always used as maintenance treatment after chemotherapy. And we've currently got access to a laparib, niraparib, and Rucaparib, and that's the brand names in, in brackets. And they've all got slightly different indications, but um, you may or may not have heard of them in the management of ovarian cancer. But we've known for a long time, it's not only BRCA cancers that are sensitive to PARP. So we've known that there's this group of patients that have also got homologous recombination deficiency. So they've lost that DNA repair, but it's not because of a BRCA abnormality. So this is don't worry about the details of this, but this pie charts just show the common mutations in high grade serous ovarian cancer. And the ones on the right, this half here, or slightly more than half are what we call our HR deficient. So they've got defective homologous recombination. And then this smaller um, part here are the ones that don't have HRD. So you can see the top quadrant, these are all the ones with the BRCA mutation, so BRCA1 or BRCA2 inherited or tumor. And then this bottom, half here or more than half. Um, these are mutations or abnormalities in other genes which control homologous recombination, but are not BRCA, but have the same effect. And we need to be able to work out a way of identifying these patients. So just as a summary, if you take all, this is mostly, I should have said, applied to high-grade serous ovarian cancer, high-grade endometrioid, although it's still relevant in some of the other subtypes, but as a whole, 50% of high-grade serous ovarian cancers are HRD. So about 20, 22% are BRCA overall, and then another 25 to 30% have got HRD through another mechanism, and then the remainder are HRD negative, or sometimes it's called HR proficient. But how do we test for it? Well, looking for the cause of 
of HRD in a tumor is a bit like, I mean, the proverbial looking for uh, trying to find a needle in a haystack, because if you take each of these um, blue dots to represent a, a different patient with ovarian cancer, we know that the BRCA abnormality, so any person, any tumor with a BRCA mutation is by definition HRD, homologous recombination deficient. And we know that's present in about 15%, so it's reasonable to test for a BRCA mutation. But if you look for the, some of the other genes in the tumor, these are not hereditary, they're just in the tumor, that are known to cause HRD, they're actually present individually at a low frequency. So say for gene A, you might get two or three cases out of 100, and then you might get one or two for gene B. And then all these other genes that contribute to, that can cause HRD are present at low frequency. So it doesn't really make sense, or it's not practical to screen every cancer for hundreds of different genes that might cause HRD. And the other thing is we don't with the exception of BRCA, we don't really know how important each of these individual genes that are hypothesized to, or thought to play a role in HRG, how important that they actually are. But what we can do is we can look at the effect of HRD. So because these tumors that have got defective HRD, they can't repair their DNA very well. So you see these really classical scars across the genome. So they have these abnormalities that are really typical and you can see them in, in the chromosomes. So this is an example of a normal chromosome. So you've got a pair, one um, uh, that, are, that are identical. And what you see if you've got defective HRD is you get these typical patterns. So here, for example, the normal ones on the left, and this is just an example for a gene, uh, you've got a red copy and an orange copy. You can get incidences where it's deleted, so that's not present on this, this leg of the chromosome, or where it's changed for a different gene. Or you can get incidences where it's duplicated, so you've got an extra copy, um, again, here it's deleted, or here you've got two genes on the one arm rather than one on each, or you can get them switching around um, uh, these translocations. And these are very typical for what you see for any tumour that's HRD, regardless of the effect. So we've now got these tests which look for this pattern of changes in the chromosomes or in the DNA. So they're looking for a scarring pattern in the cancer cell and it identifies which tumours are HRD, regardless of what caused it. So whether it was BRCA or, or abnormality in any other gene. And the advantage of this is it's an easy test to do and you don't need to look for the individual causes. So we're looking at the effect and not the cause. And why we should be testing for it, this is what's really important, is that the treatment of, here I'm talking about newly diagnosed ovarian cancer has really changed over the last few years and is very dependent on the results of the HRG test as well as the bracket test. Um, and maintenance treatment after chemotherapy and or surgery may differ depending on whether your HRD and BRCA tests are positive or negative. Um, we've had access to HRD testing in NHS in England, Wales and Northern Ireland for a few months. And actually, I just heard that today it's, it's just been approved in Scotland as of today. So the whole of the UK now has access to um, HRD testing. But to say it's only for people with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer. And then that's because the implications or, or the information that we use the results for is only relevant currently in this setting. So who should be tested? Anybody with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer who's stage three or stage four, any high grade histology um, except mucinous, um, which is a very rare subtype, and that's because we just don't see HRD in this group of patients. And it doesn't matter whether um, someone's having surgery first or whether you've only got a biopsy because they're having chemotherapy first, we can test it on either. And we should be testing as soon as possible um, once we've confirmed the diagnosis in order to um, determine the best treatment strategy for each patient. So um, as a summary, before uh, uh, 2019, really, the, the main treatment for advance, and when I say advance, we mean stage three or four ovary cancer, was either you had an operation first, followed by usually six cycles of carboplatin and platytaxel chemotherapy, um, or maybe just carboplatin, and then went on to follow up. Or you had chemotherapy first, then surgery, then three more chemotherapy, and then normal follow-up. Um, or, or there may be some people who just had chemotherapy and didn't have an operation. And we, we did have access to Avastin or Bevacizumab, um, but only for a small number of patients that, that fitted quite tight criteria. So therefore, not many people were able to benefit from the Avastin and the maintenance of Avastin. But this is all being completely really changed or blown away in the last couple of years, whereby the 
really no patients with stage three or four cancer should should have um, should just be on follow up. There should be a maintenance option for everyone, and there are a number of different treatment options available, including a laparib, niraparib, both of which are tablet PARP inhibitors. We've got the combination of a laparib and bevacizumab or avastin. Um, and then bevacizumab on its own as before. And which option you go for really depends on the results of the HRD and BRCA testing. So just to summarize, um, I'll go through this in a bit more detail, but if the tumor is BRCA positive or BRCA mutated, it doesn't matter if it's inherited or just in the tumor, there's the option to have a laparib on its own, a combination of a laparib and bevacizumab, niraparib, or I've put this in grey uh, bevacizumab on its own because um, BRCA patients should, should unless there's a, a good reason not to, should all be receiving some form of BARP inhibitor. And for those that are HRD positive but don't have a BRCA mutation, it's the same as the BRCA ones except the option for a laparib. And that's really just to do with licensing and the way the drugs became approved. And then for those uh, tumours that are HRD negative or sometimes called HRP, there's the option of niraparib or bevacizumab on its own but not the combination. And I'll just very quickly talk through the, the results of the trials which led to these indications. So uh, this was uh, first presented in 2018, so three years ago now. So this was a trial for um, only for BRCA mutation patients with ovarian cancer who'd had their chemotherapy and their surgery, and not all had had surgery, but had at least chemotherapy. Um, nearly 400 patients known to have a BRCA mutation had six cycles of chemotherapy and surgery where it was possible. And after that, they were randomized two to one to either have placebo, which was what we used to do, so just normal follow-up, or two years worth of a laparoque treatment. And what this study showed is that, you know, really they, this is a huge improvement in outcome. I mean, unprecedented, the benefit that we saw for these patients really transforming um, outcome, at least three years improvement. You know, majority of patients were free from cancer recurrence at three years. And in fact, longer follow-up data shows that this holds out to five years and beyond. And um, we know a lap is quite well tolerated and we've had access by the Cancer Drugs Fund in England and in fact, the rest of the UK for two years now for any um, lady with a ovary cancer who's got a BRCA, BRCA mutation following chemotherapy. But what about everybody else? You know, we know BRCA is only about 20% of cancers. So what about everybody else? Well, there was two other studies which included patients without BRCA. So the niraparib trial, very similar to this, the, the other trial I've just shown you, except that it included people with a BRCA mutation and those without a BRCA mutation. So about 200 patients had a BRCA and about 500 didn't. And similarly to before, they had chemotherapy and surgery where possible. And here they were randomized to niraparib or placebo. And in this case, it was given for three years. Um, now, there's not any obvious difference between the different PARP inhibitors. It's really just they're made by different companies and they've had slightly different trials done, which is why the availability varies. Here, as I said, it included BRCA patients and non-BRCA patients. And for everybody, they did HRD testing, but retrospectively, so it wasn't done at the beginning. And what they showed that um, niraparib improved the outcome for everybody, regardless of BRCA status, increased time free from cancer, and the benefit was greatest in the BRCA mutations, but it was also seen significant benefit for the non-BRCA, um, including those that were HRD positive and HRD negative. Um, it was thought not to affect quality of life, and niraparib now has approval again throughout the UK for patients regardless of BRCA or HRD status. Um, so you don't need to know your BRCA or your HRD status to have access to niraparib. And then finally, this combination. So this is the sort of newest kid on the block when it comes to treatment. We've only had access to this, certainly in England for a few months. And as I said, it's just become available in Scotland from today. Um, um, so this is a combination of a laparib and bevacizumab. So it's giving the two drugs together. So again, patients with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer who've had chemotherapy with bevacizumab and an attempt at surgery where possible, included BRCA and non-BRCA patients. And again, HRD testing was done, but again, it was done after the trial started. So it wasn't a requirement at the beginning. And here, patients were randomized to receive two years of a laparib or two years of placebo, but everybody received bevacizumab. Um, bevacizumab is also called a Vastin. So, and that was given for 15 months. 
and what they showed was that adding a laparib to bevacizumab improved the outcome, increased time for free from cancer, the biggest benefit in the BRCA patients, but also a uh, uh, benefit seen in the non-BRCA patients who were HRD positive. The difference with this trial was there was no benefit of giving a laparib in addition to bevacizumab in the patients that were HRD negative. So on that basis, the, this combination got approval um, uh, by the FDA uh, and in Europe, and then it was access on the Cancer Drugs Fund for anyone who has a cancer that is HRD positive and or has a BRCA mutation, um, but not for those that are HRD negative. And as I said, the, um, it, the decision in Scotland was made today, so it's now available throughout the UK. So that's just for those that are HRD positive. And as I said, anyone who has a BRCA mutation is by definition HRD positive. So you don't need to do the test in addition to that if you know the BRCA status. So that's uh, just going back to the pie chart, this, this, this sort of just slightly over half of patients that would be suitable for this combination. So just to summarize, in a, a sort of table form, if we look at the different maintenance options, so this is following chemotherapy, maintenance for up to three years, depending on the treatment. Um, for BRCA positive, there's a benefit of all the alaprib on its own, niraprib on its own, or the combination of alaprib and bevacizumab. For the HRD positive and the HRD negative, there's no data on alaprib on its own. That doesn't mean it doesn't work. It's just we haven't got the data to support it. But there is data for niraprib on its own, um, slightly better in the positive than negative, but still a significant benefit in the HRD negative. And then it's, this is the sort of discriminatory one. It's the alaprib and bevacizumab, which is beneficial in the positive, but not in the negative. And that's what's um, led to the licensing decision and the availability we have for drug. So based on all this data, the new cancer guidelines, so this is the European cancer guidelines and the British gynae cancer ones are about to be updated and they now recommend HRD testing for everybody in addition to BRCA testing with newly diagnosed ovarian cancer in order to choose the best treatment and to get useful information on how likely you are to benefit from PARP inhibitors. So why it's important just to summarize, we have all these options now, but we need to know the HRD uh, result in order to choose the best option. Um, that's not to say if you haven't got an HRD result, you, there isn't still options, but it, it just helps us make the most sensible decisions because we've got all these different options now. We're really moving towards a personalized approach for each individual patient rather than just giving everybody the same thing and hoping for the best we're actually thinking well these drugs work best for this and this drugs work best for this so we're really going towards this personalized approach in the first line setting um, and we get more information about who's likely to benefit so we're increasing the pool of patients likely to benefit from part beyond the the BRCA patients which are very important but it does only it only represents um, about one in five patients so it's really a great time to be involved with ovarian cancer research. You know, we've had this explosion of really positive, really significantly positive um, trial data and um, making meaningful improvements. And um, we're moving away from this one size fits all to an individualized decision making for each for each. Um, patient. Um, and HRD is just one more thing that gives us more information in order to help guide treatment options. So thank you um, very much for your time and I'm really happy to take any questions. Um, I'll stop sharing so that I can see the questions coming in. Thank you Dr Miller. I'm going to start by going through the questions that we received from people that couldn't attend Okay. Um, webinar um, but actually they're also really helpful because they will just kind of pull out some common themes um, some of it you will have covered off already but it's going to be helpful if we can just have it in question answer type format as well yeah. um, that's okay um, so a question here when will HRD testing be available in the UK for all BRCA negative cancer patients so as of today it is available everywhere in the UK so we've had it um, everywhere except for Scotland since about March, April time and in Scotland it's just become available from today but it's only for patients who are newly diagnosed who are um, not yet started their maintenance treatment in the first line setting and that's because um, later on it's not been shown to have such a benefit uh, to have such an impact so it's only for newly diagnosed patients because it's only in those patients that we can make a decision based on the results. 
Thank you. And also, um, just for anybody that's listening, what we will do is we will drop the support line number and all of the ways that you can contact the support team into the chat box, just in case anybody has any questions um, themselves personally about HRD or other elements of their, you know, other areas of their diagnosis. Um, you know, you can always give us a call tomorrow and the support team can help you unpick that. Um, so the next question, is there any advantage to be to being given a PARP inhibitor if you are BRCA negative and don't know your HRD status? So yes, there is. So the we've got um, so of the people who are BRCA negative um, and don't know their HRD, a proportion of them, probably about a third, will be HRD positive, um, you know, based on averages. And we we know that narapra particularly is beneficial to all, so not regardless of HRD status. So there definitely is a um, a, a benefit. Um, I mean, it's useful to to select the best option, but it's not compulsory. It's not necessary. You can still you still were likely to benefit regardless of your HRD status. Um, so this is probably quite a big question, but um, what role does HRD have in ovarian clear cell carcinoma? And alongside that, what research is being done or has been done specifically on clear cell? So uh, that is a big question. So HRD doesn't play such an important role in clear cells. So you don't see the same, that, you know, that pie chart I showed of all the different mutations involved in HRD, we just don't see them in clear cell. It's a completely, really a very different disease with different genes and, and abnormalities. We're fortunate in the, in the UK in that we can actually do testing in for HRD for clear cell. And um, so it's useful to have the information because there will be a, a smaller percentage that are positive. Um, and if that's the case, they would you know, definitely consider uh, PARP inhibitors. Um, but that is going to be is less of a re less relevance in this subtype than in high grade series. Um, and to the second part of your question of what research has been done in clear cell, well, um, I think I told you before that clear cell is like my favourite topic. I did my yeah. PhD in clear cell and, um, you know, there are a number, it's great to see actually there are a number of clear cell specific trials going on just now. So we've just finished an immunotherapy uh, trial in clear cell called the PCOP trial. Um, Dr. Banerjee at the Mars is running a slightly different trial, looking at a laparib with another drug. Um, and there are a couple of trials that actually just come through for clear cell specific. And indeed, um, there's a trial just open called the Bouquet study, which is for all rare subtypes of ovary cancer, not just clear cell. So there is a lot of work going on, but HRD is probably less relevant in that subtype. And just as a footnote here, um, if anybody has any questions about trials or, or how to get in touch with anybody that's running a trial, again, the support team can help with that and they can forward on queries or, or help to answer or signpost. Um, so the next question, what, if anything, can patients do to help ourselves if HRD might be a causal factor in our cancer? That's a very good question. So HRD is, it's not some, it's not, um, HRD is causal in the in the, the fact that ca as cancer evolves, it develops, it gets lots of mutation, lots of abnormality. So it's not really some. There's no predisposing factor. It's not something that someone's done or not done that's caused their cancer to be HRD. And um, I think what uh, patients can do is be aware of it and request the testing. But I think in terms of what you can do to control it, unfortunately, there's not um, something that can be done to control it. It's just a fact that cancers have got lots of mutations and some of these will cause HRD, but it's not something that's been caused or not caused by anything that an individual has done. Just unmute quick. Um, and I think you've, you've already answered this one. So might there be H HRD testing for patients who have recurrent ovarian clear cell carcinoma? Uh, so recurrent cancer, there's not a, a way to access HRD testing for recurrent cancers currently. Um, it's, it plays less of a role um, because platinum, there's various other factors. Um, it's less of a strong driver of treatment response in the recurrent setting. I mean, it would be great if we could do it. And also we know that it might biologically, it may change over time. So it'd be great if we could do it in lots of different time points, but as it stands in the recurrent setting, it won't influence treatment availability because that's not one of the determinant factors. Okay. Next question. Gosh, we really are making you work for it this evening, are we? <laughs> um, so my tumor was not tested for HRD as funding was not available at the time. However, I am BRCA2 and therefore on Avastin and Dilaparib medication. My consultant has advised there is no benefit to now test for HRD as the medication for BRCA2 patients is the same as HRD positive patients. 
So is this true or should I get my tumour tested for HRD? It's absolutely true because if you have a BRCA mutation, by by definition, it's HRD. So you don't need to do HRD testing. So um, because BRCA mutations cause HRD, so it's not necessary to do the additional test. So we've got somebody else here who's asked, why can't I get a test for HRD? I've tried, but I was diagnosed three years ago. Mm. I've told I'm not eligible. Um, so that's the case that so unfortunately the the way that it's it, the way that it's come in HRD testing is is attached to this um, combination treatment um, and that's the way it's funded and it's just it's only available when it will make a difference to treatment so in later or down the line as it stands it's not going to influence treatment decisions and therefore it's not um, not available and the other thing to say is it, it's once your HRD status um, is kind of like I said, you get the scar on your on your DNA, on your genes, and that will be there forever, even if the cancer evolves and actually it's not HRD anymore. So later down the line, it's slightly less relevant because it might not be so biologically important. Um, that's a, that's a bit of a complicated answer. <laughs> um, so we've there's also a question here. So how can we get tested for HRD? And I know that this is a question a lot of, I know this is a question we hear a lot on the support line. Now we're starting to, you know, kind of get that through and, and lack of understanding about actually what the mechanism is. Yeah, so it is available to everybody now. It's, it's um, like I said, as of today, everyone in the UK, but, um, and your oncologist and the team should be aware of it. But I think it, like all these things, sometimes it can be a bit slow to filter through. So I would just ask your treating um, oncologist or surgeon and um, whether they can do HRD testing. Now, sometimes we do the test and we can't, you know, we haven't got enough of a sample and it fails for technical reasons. So sometimes it's not without best intentions that it's been requested, but it's not possible to get it. But I think I would just encourage anyone um, who fits the criteria to ask their doctors to to, um, to to get it and if they have problems they can always you know seek an opinion from somewhere else or someone else might be able to help out with them you know you've gone on to mute victoria but do you want me to start with the questions in the i was just gonna you know after all these years like how many years have we been doing zooms and i still leave myself on mute repeatedly what an idiot. OK, so just bear with me. We've got another couple, so I'm just going to go through them. Um, so how long does Avastin work for? I've been told it only works for two years. I've had two and a half years and my oncologist wants to stop it. I'm BRCA negative. So I, uh, Avastin, that's a good one. Avastin is given in the first, in, after your first line of chemotherapy, it's either given for a year on its own or for 15 months with a laparib. Um, we don't really know how long it works for and how long, you know, because the, they're sort of arbitrary numbers that were chosen when they started the trial. I think if you've had it for more than a year, it's nearly always in the recurrent setting um, where it's, it's been given in a slightly different way. So um, I, I probably couldn't answer that specifically because that's a bit of an unusual position to be in, to have been on it for more than two years. Certainly in England, we don't have access to it in that in that way. Might be slightly um, another question here. I am on ICON 9 trial. Would they have checked my HRD status? So actually, yes, they do check it um, on the ICON 9 trial, um, but it's been done retrospectively. So um, you probably won't get that information until perhaps later. So for those of you not aware, ICON 9 is for uh, looking at recurrent ovarian cancer, giving a laparib on its own or a laparib with a, a sort of oral or tablet version of Avastin um, for people who've not had part before, but they are testing for HRD. And it, usually with these trials, it becomes available later on. So they are testing it, but it, it, it's been done in batches like retrospectively. So we've got a real scattering of different kinds of questions for you just to keep you on your toes. Um, so what is the criteria for an additional two years after the first two years of laparib with CDF? So a uh, laparib uh, after first line chemotherapy um, and surgery. So for people who have had, who've got no disease on, or in complete remission, no disease on their scan following the end of chemotherapy, it's two years. And so you can't go beyond two years. If there is evidence of disease or if you've not had an operation um, and they're still not in complete remission at the completion of chemotherapy, a laparib can be continued for as long as it's working. There's not a time limit on that. That's in the first, that's in the first line. For anyone who's having 
a laparib or another PARP inhibitor for recurrent disease, it can be carried on for as long as it's working. There's no time limit in the recurrent setting. Lovely. Okay. So I've had four cycles of bevacizumab and just started a laparib, but have reacted a lot to the laparib, a lot of vomiting. Is there an, any information on helping to tolerate it? So I'd say, um, I'm sorry to hear that, um, it's uncommon to be a lot of vomiting, but often when you start a laparib or an araparib or all the parpenters, you can feel a bit rubbish, I'm not going to lie, a bit quite nauseous, fatigue, and that usually settles down after the first month or so of treatment. Um, but there's options in terms of managing side effects. Obviously, I'd speak to your oncologist and the specialist nurses, but things like, you know, you can use anti-sickness medication like you would with chemotherapy. If it's if it's persistent, we can modify the dose of a laparib, um, and sometimes that's enough. But usually it, these symptoms do settle within the first few weeks, usually after the first month. So um, if you can, it's worth persevering, but it might be that you need a bit of supportive medication. So, you know, some anti-sickness or something. But as I said, speak to your oncologist and see what they can recommend. Thank you. Um, another question here um, about one of the rarer forms, so non-high grade. Does H have any relevance in low grade serous ovarian cancer? No. It doesn't. So it's it's low grade, a bit like clear cell. You know, there's they're considered almost different diseases, and there's not. We don't see BRCA mutations or HRD in low grade. So the HRD testing is only for high grade. So we, whilst we can test clear cells, we can't test um, low grades for HRD, and that's partly because it's not a relevant. Uh, test because it doesn't play a role in low grade. There are other genes that are um, abnormal in low grade and there's drugs coming through that target them and we're looking at you know doing those testing more regularly but it's a, it's a completely different testing panel than the HRD. Okay. So um, I'm having a laparib as first line maintenance. I have BRCA2 mutation. Will Avastin be added now to my treatment regime? Um, so that's a, a really good question. So because for if you're BRCA mutation, BRCA1 or BRCA2, you can have a laparib on its own. And there's a number of different factors that may or may not um, think about adding in Avastin. So we know that a laparib on its own in BRCA patients or indeed in a laparib on its own is actually very powerful. Um, and there may not be a need to have the addition of Avastin. Um, so it might depend on other features like whether you had an operation first, what stage your cancer was and things like that. So there is the option to have Avastin, but it may not be required because the problem with that trial is they didn't have an, a laparib only arm. So we don't know the added benefit of bevacizumab to Avastin, um, particularly for BRCA patients. So there would, it may be that your team think that our laparib is enough. And that's probably, probably right. Um, so I've missed the opportunity for a PARP as my results for being HRD came back four weeks after I finished my chemo. So it's watch and wait now. Will I get access to these later if I have a recurrence? So the first thing to say is that PARPs need to be started within um, depending on if it's a laparib or neraparib, um, up to eight to 12 weeks after chemotherapy. So that might be a window still if, it, if, if your last chemo was only four weeks ago still to have PARP. Um, I should have said the Avastin needs to be started with chemotherapy. So there's probably not an option for that combination if it was HRD positive. Um, so firstly, I would check because if you're still in with the time frame, that might be an option. And secondly, if there, if there is a recurrence, um, there's the option to have PARP inhibitors after chemotherapy in the recurrent setting. Thank you. Um, so are there any options for HRD positive patients that have recurred after taking a PARP? Uh, this is the multi-million dollar question. So PARP, uh, as you may or may not know, first came around for people with recurrent disease after chemotherapy. And now in the last few years, as I've shown you, it's in, available in the first, you know, after first line treatment. If you've had PARP after your first line chemotherapy, currently there isn't an option to have PARP again um, outside a clinical trial. And um, there's not any trials currently, but there's quite a few coming through because what we want to know is, is there a benefit of having PARP again? Um, there were some data presented at a conference in the summer which suggested that there was a benefit of having PARP again, but it's still very much in the kind of research. So as standard, you can't, there's no option to have PARP again, whether you're HRD or BRCA. Okay, so is HRD determined by a blood test or testing of the tumour sample? And I'm lumping a few questions together there, so it's just yeah. being... So, so it's tumour testing because it's not something that's in your genes. It's not hereditary. Um, you have to look at the tumour 
um, to, to find HRD. Now there probably there are some sort of sophisticated blood tests that might detect it, but the pickup rate isn't, you know, they pick up tumor cells in the blood, but actually I'm not going to confuse things. It has to be done on the tumor is the sort of standard. And the way we test it is on the tumor. I think, I think just we're just going through. So actually Molly and I are just going through. I mean, can I, just say, I think the questions have all been really good and I've given a similar yeah. talk to my colleagues and like the junior doctors and it's really, HRD is a really complicated um, thing to get your head around and the different options is, is really confusing and I actually think um, you're, this is like the smartest group of questions I've had coming <laughs> uh, by far but you know I think you know I'm happy to I have any follow-up questions I think it's you know, not an easy concept to get your head around. It's, it's very tricky. Um, we've, we've got another couple so um, would my HRD status have been tested within the 100,000 genome project? Genome project. Prescribed, yeah, Niraparib after recurrence and it has been working for two and a half years now so um the hundred thousand genome project just looked at genes it didn't do the sort of scarring signatures that you get with hrd so it, it would have obviously tested things like braca and um, but it didn't do an hrd test per se so no probably not um so we have oh can hrd be tested in circulating tumor dna well, that was my that was my point that you, there are some blood tests the circulating tumor DNA. The problem is is that yield isn't that the sorry the, the the pickup is quite low um, in ovary cancer circulating tumor DNA um, in general. So just to explain, um, when you when there's cancer, sometimes you get fragments of the DNA from the cancer goes into the bloodstream. They're not cells; they can't stick anywhere and grow, but you can pick up the DNA as being abnormal as being different. Um, it, it, the testing in ovary cancer hasn't been that successful because the yield is quite small, there's quite small rates, but technically you could do HRD, but it's not really something that we do. Thank you. Um, we've got another question that's fairly non-specific, so I wonder whether or not um, the person that asked it might want to just add a little bit of context. Um, I have BRCA1 variant, is there any information for this? But I think probably more specifically with regard to HRD. Uh, yeah, so the variance is when we do a BRCA test and it's, the gene is not normal, but it's not got an abnormality associated with it that has been seen before that's known to definitely be a mutation. Um, so I personally, when we have a BRCA variant, usually treat as benefit of the, you know, treat as BRCA. Um, and if you've had an HRD test on top of that, it would probably be, you, you, you could be driven by the HRD results. So the BRCA variants, what we certainly I would do would be refer to, um, if it's in the blood anyway, to the geneticist who can give a bit more information. And what they do is they collect information on these variants and then sometimes reclassify them as mutations if, if um, you know, they see lots of them. So it is a tricky one because it's neither negative or positive, the result, but it's sort of sitting on the fence a bit. Um, so it would depend a bit on HRD. That would definitely be useful to have HRD status on top of that. Thank you. So that, I think, draws us to a close, Dr. Miller. And um, yeah, we've got a perfect in there. So I think we've done all the questions and we've had a, a whistle stop tour that was actually very understandable, which actually completely surprised me because every time anybody says HRD, I start to think, oh, heavens, panic. I'm going to understand this. Um, I think but, a lot of yeah. my colleagues think like that as well. <laughs> yeah, it's not very straightforward. And um, I just wanted to say a massive thank you from all of us just for being so wonderful over the last couple of years and being so very, very helpful to us at Overcome and also to so many of the patients and our beneficiaries who have asked questions that we forwarded on to you. Oh, yeah. And um, thank you for running and talking and giving webinars and just frankly being wonderful. Um, you are definitely one of our favourite people. Well, I can say it's a pleasure helping doing the talk and answering questions, but running is not a pleasure. That was not something I enjoyed. Well, if any any of the if anybody who's joined us today would like to take on a run next year, or if you have friends or family who would like to take on a run, we are going to be doing the uh, the Bacchus. Bacchus. 10k again in September 2022. So that will be me and Dr. Miller and hopefully some other uh, clinical colleagues of yours and definitely some other colleagues of mine from Overcome. Um, so with 
I think we've, we've I think we've covered all the questions. If we get any more in from anybody, then we will put those to Dr. Miller. And also, if there are any kind of questions that occur to you that you don't think we've answered, um, then just get in touch with the support team. Molly's already put the contact details into the chat box. Um, so do feel free to contact us at any time, really, any day. Um, you don't have to squeeze all your questions into one webinar and we will make sure that we forward them on and, and get back to you with the answers. Um, so we've got lots of thanks coming to you, Dr. Miller, for being marvellous and for giving us your time and a very, very Merry Christmas to you. And I hope you're getting a good rest over Christmas. You're very welcome. Thanks very much.